time, if that's okay with everybody. But okay, um, again, I want to uh, welcome you all. My name is Maura Farrell and I'm with uh, NUI Galway and the Rural Studies Centre in Galway. And I want to, uh, I suppose, on behalf of our, our collaborating partners, the Department of Rural and Community Development, I want to welcome you and uh, most sincerely for registering for our fourth uh, seminar in the Rural Voices Seminar Series. So really, I suppose, what we've tried to do over the last few months is, you know, bring snippets of research that is going on around Ireland that relates, I suppose, to rural communities, to rural economies, to rural businesses, uh, to rural individuals, rural society. And we've tried to bring all of that research to you from the Rural Studies Centre in, uh, in UI Galway in conjunction with the Department for Rural and Community Development. And I'm delighted today to have our fourth seminar coming from to us from the Munster uh, Technological University. And we've got two people today that are going to present a presentation called Awareness and Potential of the Silver Economy for Enterprises and Society in Rural Areas. And we've got two people presenting from um, MTU and um, Ashling Conway, Dr. Ashling Conway Lenehan is one of our presenters and Ashling is a lecturer in economics and uh, she's also a researcher with the Hinks Centre for Entrepreneurial um, um, entrepreneurship excellence at Munster, Munster Technological University. Ashling is a project lead in this Interreg European Silver Small to Medium Enterprise Project and has a key objective of encouraging entrepreneurship and innovation in the silver economy. And Ashling's current research interests include the silver economy, aging populations, entrepreneurial education, family business and innovation. And Ashling has presented uh, nationally and internationally and also has uh, peer reviewed international publications as well. And alongside Ashling today, we also have Helen McGurk. And Helen is the head of the Hinks Centre for Entrepreneurship Excellence at the School of Business, Munster Technological University. And Helen's work uh, centres on supporting entrepreneurship in all, I suppose, forms at regional, national and international levels. And Helen's research, again, focuses around many of these areas, and that includes the economics of innovation, entrepreneurship, SME competitiveness and public policy. And Helen's research is also published in some top academic journals. And Helen has presented in a huge number of conferences, both national and international. And she also represents the Monster Technological University on the government department of rural and community developments, higher education and research network that we are uh, in collaboration with via the Rural Voices seminar series. So Helen has also had many years of experience in industry, rural development, and as an entrepreneur in Ireland and in Australia. And with that international context, Helen is actually joining us today from Spain. And she might kind of maybe fill us in and whether she's out there on holidays or whether she's on work, but I think it's work. So she might fill us in on that uh, shortly. So I think at this stage, I'm going to hand over to Ashling and Helen for their presentation in relation to the silver economy. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen with you now and apologies for my camera. Um, it's jumping around here this afternoon. Okay. Okay, um, more I might just confirm that you can see the, the first slide there. Yes, Ashley, you're ready to go here. Perfect. Okay, so um, thank you to NYG and the team uh, for the invite. Um, myself and Helen are delighted to speak with you this afternoon on the emerging area of the silver economy. So in terms of what we're going to present uh, to you today, um, this is just what the structure will look like. So I'll take you through an overview of what the silver economy actually is. 
um, some stats around the size of the silver economy and population aging. I'll speak to you a little on the Silver SME Interreg EU project that Maura mentioned there at the start. Um, the Hink Centre is currently a partner in that project. And finally, I will tell you about the special issue <clears throat> in the Small Enterprise Journal that myself and Helen are our guest editors on. Helen then will take you through um, the published journal and conference paper in this area. And finally, we'll wrap up with some thoughts um, on future research. So what is the silver economy? There is lots of different definitions of the silver economy, especially around the age group. And for the purposes of the research that we've been involved in, we focused on the over 50s. So it looks at um, the spending and the needs of those who are over 50 um, around products and services. And it looks at this, the spending on goods and services and the multiplier effect that this generates. So research has been done on behalf of the European Commission and they have estimated that the silver economy is worth 3.7 trillion euros. And this is estimated to increase to 5.7 trillion euros in 2025. It contributes 32% of gross domestic product for the EU, and it supports 38% of EU employment. Based on that data, the European silver economy is currently the third largest economy in the world after China and the US. So I suppose what we're showing and what, what we're trying to do is create awareness around a silver economy and that enterprises need to recognize the emerging silver economy as a potential market opportunity and respond to global trends of considering older um, adults as target groups. So what we have here is the EU population age structure of three major age groups in 10 year blocks from 2020 to 2040. The two age groups up to 64 are projected to decrease as a proportion of total population, while those aged 65 and over is projected to increase out to 2040. So, EU population is getting older and increasing longevity, falling fertility rates and migration are considered drivers of population aging. Furthermore, looking at the estimated and projected EU median age, looking initially at the EU average, you can see there in 2020 was 42 years um, for the EU average and then increasing to 44.8 in 2040. Ireland's median age in 2020 was 37.5 years and this is estimated to increase to 41.5 years in 2040. Countries with a higher median age um, as illustrated there, Poland, Spain, Slovenia and Portugal. So these tend to be older countries um, within the EU. Currently, Cyprus and Ireland have the lowest median age in the EU based on this data. By 2060, one in three Europeans will be over 65. Um, Europe's working age population is shrinking. The ratio of working people to those who are inactive is decreasing from four to one to two to one by 2060. So there's no doubt that Europe's population is getting older. And while Ireland's data compares favorably at the moment, you know, that trend will, we will follow that trend um, going forward. So 
Moving on to the Interreg Europe project um, called Silver SME. Um, this is a project um, that the Hink Center has been a partner in for the last three years. And there is a strong focus in this project in terms of influencing policy. So a key objective of the project is around the implementation of policies for companies and really to basically to show the opportunities that are there within the silver economy and raise awareness around those opportunities. Again, looking at goods and services that will contribute to improve the quality of life within an aging society in rural and remote areas. Um, as late as this week, um, the Southwest Regional Enterprise Plan to 2024 was launched. And we are delighted to say that we have successfully influenced policy and an action on the silver economy is now included in that enterprise plan. And the Hink Centre in MTU is the action lead. So that's the act, the Pacific action there, 1.7 in the plan that was launched there Tuesday of this week. So exploring the new niche market opportunities for regional enterprises and new startups in the silver economy. So we're absolutely delighted about that. You know, we've been working in this area for the last couple of years. And, you know, one of the key, um, you know, findings is coming out of this is to raise more awareness and to make policymakers aware of this emerging um, area. So in terms of the project, um, there are nine partners across the EU involved in it. So you have Sweden, Poland, uh, Slovenia, Belgium, France. Uh, we have two partners in Spain, Portugal, and we're the Irish partner. Um, the focus of this project is those living in remote, rural and mountainous areas across eight EU countries. Also a focus of this project is around um, those that are active, um, that are over 50, those that are dependent, that are over 50, and those who are more vulnerable over 50. So I suppose it's important for companies to recognize these different groups and the opportunities that may present. Looking at the data, and um, this is most recent data from Eurostat, and what I have here is the percentage of those who are over 65 in predominantly rural regions. So predominantly rural is the share of the population living in rural areas where it's higher than 50%. So looking at the data here, so the EU, again, it's across the EU 27 countries, 22% of those who are over 65 primarily live in predominantly rural regions. Comparing that then, um, Spain, Portugal and Sweden lie above that EU27 figure, whereas Belgium and Ireland lie below. So again, you can see Ireland's figures, um, you know, are, I suppose, differentiating really from um, our EU counterparts. The regions are the countries that come in the lowest um, are Turkey and Iceland. So in terms of the percentage of those who are over 65 living in predominantly rural regions. As part of the project so far, a key output has been um, the 72 good practices um, that we've generated as part of the project. So this is across the nine EU regions, the eight EU countries. So we've collected good practices of companies and initiatives operating in the silver economy across rural, remote and mountainous regions. Again, those good practices are differentiated by, you know, some come under the active group, 
some are more for suitable for dependence, and again, some are su more suitable for those who are more vulnerable. The good practices are featured in health and well-being, housing, and IT. For example, in, in terms of Ireland, we put forward seven good practices. So of 72, there's seven of them are Irish uh, good practices. Um, so for example, one Irish good practice that we've presented uh, to the partnership is the Freebird Club. And this is a social travel club for the over 50s. So this is where the host actually socializes with their guests. And they have four and a half thousand members across 80 countries. So it's social traveling for older adults. Um, Helen's conference paper will go into these good practices in more detail shortly. So <clears throat> over the last two years, myself and Helen have been working on this special issue. Um, it's called Small Enterprises and the Silver Economy. And myself and Helen have been uh, guest editors and delighted to say that we're coming to the end of this body of work and we're looking at a publication date um, of May of this year. Um, as I said at the start, this is an emerging area. So the papers in this special issue will be a valuable addition to the emerging topic in the literature and will contribute to the knowledge and empirical evidence of the opportunities an older population holds for enterprises. Some papers within the publication focuses on the supply side of the economy, and some papers look at investigating the motives, attitudes, and experiences of older entrepreneurs. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is just going to hand you over to Helen, who's going to take you through um, a, a peer review paper that we've been working on, a conference paper, and a few other items of future research. So thank you for now and happy to take questions at the end. Thank you, Ashling uh, and uh, Ola uh, from uh, Burgos uh, in uh, central Spain. Um, in actual fact, I'm in Lerma, which is a town about 30 minutes drive uh, north of uh, Bogos. Um, and uh, Maura, thank you very much uh, for the invite to tell people where I am, um, because I, I think it's actually very poignant, given what uh, the focus of this uh, um, presentation is, um, and that's for uh, rural uh, studies. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm in this very rural, uh, remote uh, area, um, but most progressive. Um, I'm here as part of the Silver SME Project study visits, um, and we're actually visiting some of the uh, 72 work, um, you know, good practices that Ashling has spoken about. Um, so uh, it's wonderful after two years of, of COVID um, and all the Zoom process of looking at these good practices as partners that we're here today um, with all the partners from the eight regions. Each of those eight regions are very rural. Um, so one of the villages uh, we visited, apologies because I'm in a restaurant, um, uh, the joys of uh, rural, um, because now I, I'm, I'm speaking to you on perfect Wi-Fi, um, but one of the villages had 80 people living there um, and its support trying to uh, uh, repopulate um, through enterprise development. Um, so just to get on to uh, why we're here, and that's the peer review uh, paper, um, uh, this is uh, a co-authored paper by, uh, with Ashling and Neve Lenhan from the Department of Management and Enterprise at MTU. Um, and it's, uh, it, it comes from the Silver SME and our uh, interest in this area for the academic. Um, so the Silver SME is very much around policy, um, but we as, as academics wanted to get it out and, and have it uh, evidence-based uh, research um, and to add to the stock of knowledge 
um, albeit limited uh, currently uh, in the area of older population. So the, the aim of the paper um, is uh, addresses the supply side. Um, so supplying goods and, and services. Um, so the enterprise side of it, um, uh, of the silver economy and uh, contributes to our understanding of enterprises awareness. So before we even talk about uh, what enterprises does, we, we were interested in to see what the level of awareness. So their awareness, for example, of uh, the term silver economy, the awareness of whether there's training there, the awareness of the value or the, the, the potential value of an older population in their regions. So this was all, these were all questions we were interested in. So uh, again, um, we looked, we used uh, primary qualitative uh, data from eight so you, well, we talked before about the eight uh, rural, regional, rural, remote and mountainous regions um, related to the, the project. And 160 interviews were carried out with SMEs, policymakers and social partners and research partners. So taking the SMEs, so we, we, we wanted to see about uh, the awareness of, of SMEs. So there were uh, 40 of these um, interviews and we analysed those um, uh, using content analysis. Ashley, next slide. Yeah, um, so um, I could talk now for the next hour about this paper, but because we have a limited time and I want to squash in another uh, paper, um, the findings from uh, digging deep into these 40 interviews with the SMEs. Um, now these SMEs were not specifically related to the silver economy, they were just generally um, small and medium sized enterprises. Um, and obviously we interviewed some from, from Ireland as well. Um, while we find some firms were aware of um, the silver economy, um, many um, had it as a social or that caring uh, view. So when they were asked about what is the silver economy, they said, oh, it's something about uh, social care. It's something about nursing homes. It's something about uh, health care. So you can see where the, the, the very focused on health and uh, care. The awareness of the potential for um, uh, enterprises to benefit or to exploit the silver economy was was quite weak. Um, many had never considered um, uh, providing goods and services uh, to this cohort. Um, probably uh, tourism was the one that uh, came out the strongest, uh, albeit uh, limited as well. Um, there was a lack of awareness of training and public supports um, at regional level. Um, and I suppose the, uh, and, and Ashley alluded to it um, earlier, we have now implemented this through uh, our, uh, you know, local um, enterprise plan um, launched yesterday. Um, so it is uh, that looking at, uh, research with impact. So we are impacting, um, we are um, making aware um, the enterprises, the public bodies, and that's what we're going to do now for the next couple of years is, is raising awareness. Um, so that's a, a very, uh, very whistle top store, uh, tour of the first um, paper, which is published. There is a link here. Um, and these slides, I presume, uh, Maura, will be shared. Um, so the link is there, but you can Google us. Yes, I know. Yep. Thanks, Maura. Um, so the second one, um, if you can move on there, Ashley. Thanks. So the second one is uh, a paper that uh, is co-authored with uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Katrina Heffernan, uh, the Department of Nursing uh, in MTU. Um, and we're uh, taking a healthcare look at uh, the silver economy. And uh, I suppose it's, it's a, a multidisciplinary paper. So we're looking at uh, health and nursing 
and uh, the economic papers around the silver economy. So living well in older age, opportunities for a sustainable silver economy in rural areas. So this paper was first presented um, at the Engaging Aging uh, 2021 um, at uh, DCU um, in, back in November. Um, and we're now working on the great comments that we got um, and we'll target uh, an academic journal now early summer. So if you th think of uh, technological advances and aging population, um, the desire for living well at home or what is termed now aging in place has the potential to create valuable opportunities um, for the um, silver uh, economy. This is particularly important in rural areas. And this is the focus of all this uh, data that we're using is in rural areas. The paper considers the synergies uh, required to support people who uh, want to live well at home while simultaneously promoting um, a sustainable uh, silver economy. So we looked at the 72 good practices um, and we looked at them with, um, based on the literature, we came up with two themes um, and, and we, we coded these 72. Um, the first one was uh, opportunities for SMEs and the second uh, theme was uh, potential to support um, people to live well at home or aging in place. Um, the next uh, slide there, Ashley. Yeah, so of the 21, um, sorry, of the uh, 72 good practices um, across, uh, from across uh, Europe, um, 21 of them fulfilled the two themes. So um, potential for uh, SMEs and, uh, you know, uh, people living well at home. And the 52, or sorry, 51 of the, the good practices had just one theme. And most of them were um, people uh, living well at home. The in-depth analysis then took place at, at, on the 21 and, um, uh, good practices. So opportunities for businesses to support older people, specifically active and fragile older people. That's what we found. Um, and, and that would be uh, quite intuitive that you would have the uh, more active and fragile uh, and that group would be where they may need some assistance or some piece of equipment in their house to live well at home. Um, the findings also found that SMEs that provided products and services were centred around the healthcare, which would be a given. Uh, tourism, as I mentioned earlier, leisure um, and accessibility. So that came down to ICT. Um, there was uh, one good practice, for example, that uh, used um, the, the 3D glasses, um, uh, but it was a technology that you had it on a screen that it gave access to people that uh, were had access uh, problems getting into maybe uh, a museum with many stairs or an old castle, uh, but they wanted to see inside it. Um, and it also uh, gave people the opportunity um, to see and to be tourists from their own home. So that's just to give you an example. Um, just on that, um, all these good practices are online, as Ashley mentioned. So um, the, the other one was, um, I, I, and I suppose it feeds into our other paper and uh, our continued research is the requirement for more uh, integrated approach to planning to support an increasing number of older people who want to live well at home or uh, age in place. So an integrated, to have healthcare, to have enterprise policy, working together to see how uh, they can support each other. Because as we all know, uh, if we have a sustained population in our rural areas, um, that's going to have a knock-on effect uh, for small um, and micro, small and, and medium enterprises. But it also has that uh, encouraging um, others to move 
back or uh, relocate uh, to rural areas. So it very much is uh, a living uh, topic um, and, and one of great interest uh, and plenty of uh, future uh, research uh, areas. Um, Ashin, can you move the next one? So for future projects uh, and research, um, we are uh, a consortium successful in securing another uh, European Commission funded project focusing on the silver economy. Um, you know, what we're going through the, the uh, finer details of the contracts. So obviously I'm not going to uh, divulge all the lovely uh, information yet, um, but we're absolutely thrilled um, to be part of this consortium uh, that will roll out um, a two year uh, project, quite a large one for ourselves uh, in this area. So building up um, this uh, uh, stock of knowledge around the silver economy again, this project is rural based um, around uh, developing uh, the policies in this area. We are also uh, supervising a master's student in uh, the area of uh, the silver economy. Um, and we, as all of us, as, as researchers, welcome discussion um, uh, in new projects and new project ideas, uh, perhaps co-supervising a PhD in this area um, or a, a project, whether it's national or an internationally funded uh, project. Um, could you just move the next slide? Because I think we're, we're nearly done. Yeah, so really, I suppose, to conclude and, and, and uh, from this, uh, this seminar series, uh, we tend to hear in-depth um, research from maybe one or two project, uh, two papers um, or pieces of research. Um, and, and here, um, and, and, and that's the, the, the whole beauty of this uh, wonderful series is that we're sharing um, all types of, the, of research um, that is going on in this area. Um, so to conclude our uh, overview of the silver economy, the silver SME project, the um, special issue, uh, the peer reviewed uh, publication, the conference paper. Um, I just want to sum up on a few points um, and, and maybe you'll take away a few uh, ideas um, and put them, bring them back into your work. So the awareness and the value of the potential for enterprises to produce and sell goods and services to or for people should be communicated and supported by public policy. And we see that the Southwest uh, has certainly embraced that. In order to bridge the gap between the awareness and say the action of doing and producing um, goods and services, um, there is a role for policy. Um, to support entrepreneurship and enterprises to serve this um, silver economy. There is, there's an untapped market there. So if you're supporting enterprises or if you're uh, looking at er new areas for research, have a look at this area um, for potential ideas. And as always, it's research with impact. Um, sustainable European projects. So this is an example of um, how a European project has uh, had a ripple effect uh, on different areas of our research work. So Mila Boykas um, oh, um, uh, on Spawn and Arashkut uh, Mora. Or amino agot, Helen. Um, that's great, Helen and Ashling. Thanks so much. Um, you know, I, I think before we, we move ourselves to questions, um, definitely there, there's so many aspects of the silver economy that are so interesting, you, you know, from, I suppose, that supply chain to the silver economy and maybe even, um, you know, that idea of older people in rural areas starting up their own enterprises, their own businesses. But I, I remember um, back in 20. 2009, we did a, a Framework 7 project at the time, European Framework 7 project at the time, and we actually looked at uh, enterprises in rural areas, and one of them enterprises was actually, uh, it was a social enterprise, 
and it was Roscommon Home Services. And they were an organization that are now 20 years in the making. And at the time, they were one of the first organizations to look at this idea of aging in the home and providing services for older people in the home. And I remember a few years ago, going back to the woman who started this up or who was involved in running this Veronica Barish. And I remember Veronica telling me that they had 500 people part time employed in this business. And this is a business that's still going strong today. Um, so, uh, you know, that provision of a service for the silver economy is really a strong part of rural enterprise and rural development. So it's definitely something that I saw very, very strongly, Helen and Ashley coming through in your presentations, which was really, really interesting. So with that in mind, I'm going to open it to the chat or open it to the floor. I really don't mind. If anybody wants to come in from the floor, um, please feel free to do so. Both Helen and Ashling, I think, are available to uh, to answer some questions. I'll give you a minute. I might I might um, add there, Amora, just so I pick up something that you said there. So while we were looking at enterprises um, providing goods and services, uh, providing marketing, producing for older or two older people, that doesn't exclude the older entrepreneur so it, it's not that this conversation is excluding that and it'll be very interesting to hear um around um you know views on on the older entrepreneur um because at the hink center we've had a phd uh study on uh, older entrepreneurs so um yeah i'll open that up yeah absolutely um steve i see your mic has gone off there i don't know if you want to come in yeah um oh, yeah. The truth is, Maura, it's, a, it's an open goal for us. I, everything Helen said is spot on. I really worry. I can just tell you, and you both know what goes on on the ground. We shoved them out the door um, by 1665. If you look at people on the rural social schemes, uh, you know, you have the five-year, six-year limit. Um, even the people we, we support through the different phases, through the local development companies, uh, we are losing so much in terms of, uh, you know, knowledge, experience, uh, one of the ladies, just uh, Sue Clark, who would be an icon or a, a legend in terms of Galway Rural Development, uh, retired uh, yesterday after 20 years. And I was left with such a feeling of loss because what's gone out the door is, uh, isn't is just the knowledge and expertise. It's the, the one-stop shop for knitting everything together, understanding where schemes were and where the different supports were, seeing the evolution over you know two to three decades. And then um, it's a huge gap. And I was thinking this morning, uh, I took my new doggy for a walk and I tend to wash around things in my head before the day, a way of trying to keep these people involved. Uh, I know there's little mechanisms like for from the leader point of view, you have uh, evaluation committees or obviously on, on boards of, of different organizations, but something stronger, I think I'd love to see Helen, whereby we could use that. We have them on tap, uh, a mechanism whereby um, we could support the people with that kind of expertise to to elevate others who are maybe even are of the same vintage to stay involved and to to rebuild and to create again it's creating uh, you know opportunities for others and keeping again it's all about rural ireland and keeping life mm. there and yeah. uh, i do think we're losing that piece where if somebody gets to 60 we're nearly handing the the, the golden key and and the mm. one for all voucher yeah, Steve, thanks. Uh, uh, can I come in on that one about it, it, it's about intergenerational learning. We, we have so much to learn from younger people, older people, and we shouldn't be differentiating them on that, to be fair. Um, but we have a lot to learn. Um, and the good practices um, that Ashing and I've been uh, working on for the last two, three, four, four years now, um, some of them have excellent ideas on how to um, integrate people that have uh, retired and some retiring early. Um, so it, it could be something that's off the wall, maybe, you know, um, thinking outside the box, perhaps. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I might just come in, there. Want to come in there as well. Yeah, so I suppose one thing that this project has highlighted for me, I suppose, is the, the segregation and maybe the, the grouping, you know, 
um, for older adults, you know, you've got an active, a really large portion of older adults are active. When we think of older adults, you know, what companies are providing are in healthcare, maybe for more dependent and vulnerable adults. But there's an active age cohort there that are over 50 who are looking for goods and services. Um, population, I showed you the stats on population, population aging at start. You know, this is something that's coming and it's coming faster in some EU countries than others. And there's huge opportunity there for enterprises to provide um, goods and services for that age group, uh, for, for those age cohorts. Um, so yeah, so look, that was just one point I wanted to mention. I think that's, um, that's a really important point uh, to note. Absolutely, Ashling, and I, I think you know um, we often kind of criticise um, policies for having too much of an economic focus rather than a social focus. And I think from an economic perspective, we probably really should be looking towards um, you know the economic advantage that you would have of older people in rural areas. I think again, we're always thinking about um, older people and and poverty issues, but we should also see older people and them as an economic advantage in a rural area as well. So I, I, I think sometimes we fall too much on one side of, of maybe older people in poverty without thinking of the potential of the older person in a rural area that could have an economic advantage as well as them having setting up their own business. Um, let's see, is there anybody else who'd like to come in there? I know it's something that um, we've been working on in actually Ashling Marta wants to come in there as well Ashling. No, no thanks Maura um, I just it, it's it's so lovely to hear kind of a positive story of opportunity um, relating to rural areas and relating to older populations which kind of can be I suppose a and more you can hear about the negatives more than the positives um, and from the project that I work on with with Mora that Mora leads ruralization it's all about trying to identify these areas of opportunity for rural areas um, and I just wondered from your research you'd kind of mentioned um, healthcare um, and tourism as kind of areas that there's more awareness are there kind of areas that you see maybe in the countries that have the kind of older population maybe are facing this issue to a greater degree than than Ireland that um that there are what are the sectors of opportunity I guess I'm thinking perhaps you know in a pre in previous research I've worked on is related to creative industries and you know th those industries are constantly looking for you know, new avenues, new markets, be it, you know, in the arts that it, they can target, you know, a particular sector or if it's artists that they can target particular age groups with classes, you know, is there, are there any sectors that particularly jump out as maybe untapped in terms of the, the silver economy? A big one. <laughs> Thanks, Ashley. I, I can take that first. I, I think um, leisure, uh, cultural things uh, did come up uh, in, in uh, areas, came up in, in the good practices um, for us. Um, but a, a, an area uh, that may be uh, of interest is uh, while it's around uh, tourism, um, but also um, the, the post COVID, I suppose now it's that uh, teleworking or that uh, health um, well-being that well-being um, kind of air sector. Um, technology is, is, is a big, big one. Um, there's a huge potential there. So that would be, uh, could be around smart housing um, using technology. Um, Ashley, do you want to come in on that one? Yeah, I was just going to add about the housing and the smart housing. Um, uh, Sweden um, would have invested a lot in the areas of smart housing um, for older adults and ICT. Um, but as I mentioned in the stats earlier on, Spain is probably the country that is already in it in terms of population aging. You know, you've seen it there in terms of the percentage of 60 um, of 65s that are predominantly living in rural regions. And they also have a high percentage um, of those who are 65 overall. 
Um, but yeah, certainly housing, I would add to, um, to concur with what Helen said there. Great, Ashling, thanks a million. I just see a comment in there from Gareth. Gareth, if you do you want to come in yourself on in on that? Looking at different products. Yeah, I just <clears throat> just the wearable uh, products, smartwatches and activity trackers um, that are there, the, the potential for the um, the older consumer. That's all really. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think this ties in very much as well, Shane, I'm going to come to you now. I think this ties in very well. You know, this concept of smart villages is something that really has, um, I suppose, become quite prominent across Europe and now across Ireland. And I think that idea of smart villages, again, looking at that kind of smart, particularly in relation to older people and in relation to what can be provided um, for them within mm -hmm. a particular or rural area. That's another area, I suppose, that really should be considered within the smart village kind of thinking. Shane, did you want to come in there? Yeah, it's just a query, I suppose. My own research is on um, the farming community predominantly and uh, the social and emotional issues affecting older farmers and how that impacts on the sustainability of farming and the broader rural society. But I suppose I, I, I'm not, I have, I suppose I've been researching the farming community for so long, but it, I don't really see much uh, connection with the silver economy, um, particularly because uh, a third of farmers in Ireland and across the EU are over 65 and they are still producing food. They are still producing, you know, their outputs, even though they might be seen in a policy perhaps as holding the industry back, they're still contributing. So I'm just wondering, has there been any research on the silver economy in relation to the farming sector? Because, you know, across the world, it's aging but yet they're still producing. So they, they do contribute. So that was just a query really. Yeah, um, not specifically around the farming sector. I'm actually uh, from that background myself. So I, I can relate to what you've just said there, Shane, mm. um, in terms of the emotional and social side of it. But I guess, I suppose, um, I suppose what you'd be looking at from a farming perspective is looking at them as a consumer rather than on the supply side. So they would be a consumer like anyone else is, you know, whether they work in industry or, or whatever sector they work in. Um, and they too are looking for goods and services to meet their own um, social needs, leisure needs, uh, and so on. And just to come back to Maura's point as well about the smart villages I suppose one thing that our EU partners were very interested in is our rural link service here in Ireland um you know where we have bus routes available in rural areas I'm from West Waterford and you know I live in a rural part of West Waterford and rural link serves our community very very well and our EU partners were very interested in that and in that concept of um, you know, providing transport um, for local people, whether they're young or old, the service is there. Um, so yeah, so that's just another point to, to note. Thanks, Ashling. See, is there anybody else who wants to come in there? Um, again, Ashling, I, I was kind of very interested in you know the policy action. I think that's a really that's a fantastic outcome. I think you know, no matter what project we any of us get involved in, I, I think our ultimate aim is to impact policy and to make some changes in and around the research that we're doing. And I think it's great to see that in relation to the Southwest Plan that you have made that kind of um, I suppose impact on policy. Do you want to expand a little bit more on that? We'll say how did how did you go about getting uh, involved in that? Did they contact you? Did they come into contact with the research? And what kind of a policy action it, 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 do you think will come out of this? Yeah, so as part of the EU project, um, we had to develop an action plan. So this was one of the key objectives of the project as a whole, is this idea of impacting on policy and bringing policy um, with us, essentially. So we looked at um, well, basically how the how it works is you look at um, experiences from other EU partners and look at bringing them back here to Ireland, essentially. So something that we have seen that's done well 
in other EU partner countries that we would look at introducing potentially here through policymakers. So um, in terms of there's, there's been targeted um, and tailored training for enterprises in rural areas um, in Spain and in France. So we are looking at bringing that here to Ireland. So we approached um, the Southwest Regional Enterprise Plan and basically spoke to them about our idea and so on. And they were very happy to partner with us on this. And um, yeah, look, it's huge for us to get it included as an action. Um, they have seven objectives and it comes under objective number one. And as I said, it was just published there yesterday. So we now have been invited on to um, the working group for that particular action. And MTU is the action lead on it. Um, so basically we will be working with other stakeholders like local enterprise office, Enterprise Ireland, IDA Ireland, and other stakeholders to try now and implement that action. Um, and really it's going to be really focusing around the training aspect, the familiarization aspect, and really making enterprises aware of the opportunities that exist uh, within the silver economy. Yeah. Do you think that's an issue, Ashley? And you know, I might, I might put it to a few more as well. Do you think that people setting up businesses in rural areas, do you think that they don't consider the silver economy as you know that economic base that they really should be tapping into? I don't, I don't um like and I think it's it's just the lack of awareness. I think you know. Um, I spoke to the program manager of the Southwest Regional Enterprise Plan last week, and again, he was coming at it from, you know, knowing very little about the silver economy. Um, and I don't think that awareness is there amongst um, companies. You know, as I said, the, the statistics speak for themselves in terms of, you know, more of us are living longer. We want to, you know, live long and active lives, healthy lives. And we're looking for goods and services to meet our needs, you know. So I definitely think um, I don't think companies not, you know, some companies don't have that knowledge. And there's definitely scope and opportunity there uh, to create that awareness. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just thinking, Steve, I'm just wondering in relation to people applying for funding in relation to the local action groups and maybe the leader, do you think that they, they do consider the silver economy when they're starting up new enterprises or is it? I, I, I don't think, uh, as I was saying to Helen earlier, I don't think we do. I know I don't. If I'm honest, you, you, your brain is nearly set in a particular way, Mara, and, mm -hmm. and every now and again, you need to, to shake ourselves out of it. Um, I suppose we, uh, in terms of leader, uh, it becomes a habit. The, the streams and the history of leader means it's, it's difficult for us to move and see things. But uh, Helen was also right. I mean, the mix of new people coming in or would ask the question, why not? Um, and, and I think some of the changes we see, not just with leader, but, you know, as you know, we, we, we do application for RRDFs and uh, the range of different programs. And you learn as much from that because you're bringing... Uh, ideas that uh, of new funding streams and you know if, if I can fund this and just an example I mean recently through SICAP which is social inclusion and the community activation program that a lot of the local development companies have around the country we've actually started funding things like equipment uh, you know years ago we never have thought of doing streamers and lawnmowers for the great economy and for uh, for that uh, tranche I mean we, we, all we've been doing was you know, laptops and they were setting up offices and, you know, chess clubs and it's so stereotypical. Whereas that has changed in the last two years, we realized the ask isn't everybody, we all have devices now to, to so, so some of it was ourselves waking up, but an awful lot of it was led by the questions we were being uh, challenged on and the requests that were coming in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think even myself, it's been a bit of a wake up call, I suppose. You know, we're so programmed to think about um, inclusion issues, poverty issues in rural areas. Sometimes we don't actually think about the potential of the silver economy for rural areas and how really, um, I suppose, all of this smart kind of thinking that we're involved in, you know, a lot of it should be targeted towards um, older age groups. And it, I suppose that's an inclusion in itself. So to yeah. do that, Ashling, I suppose, is, is, is where we need to go. Yeah, and, and just to pick up on the funding point, 
I think it's 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 that it sends out a strong message from Europe. Europe is investing in this, you know, EU projects, the EU Commission are commissioning reports on the silver economy. It's going to filter in to national level, it's going to filter in to EU member states, and it will filter down into organizations like um leader and, and so on and local enterprise offices. It's, it might take some time, but it is coming. And, and as I said, the fact that the EU is already there in terms of the investment they're making um, in terms of the silver economy. Yeah, absolutely, Ashling, And I think we, we have found that ourselves as well. You know, the calls that often come for us from a European perspective for research, um, it, you know, the calls are often an indicator of the key issues that the European Commission are looking at, which in turn often become the key issues that we will look at here in a national level. And again, it's how the funding starts to filter down. So we have made that connection ourselves in relation to particularly rural, that if these calls are coming for research, this is the kind of ways in which the funding starts to funnel itself down as well. So yeah. Uh, and, you know, in, in Cork and Council, another good practice that we featured was an age friendly program. And you know, some of the attendees here today might be familiar with that. Um, it was a pilot program put out to four towns in County Cork and um, one being ban um, Bandon. And it's basically whereby enterprises in the town um, sign up to this age friendly charter. So. It could be something like as simple as you go into a coffee shop and the writing is bigger. You go into a pharmacy and you've got a chair with hand rests. You've got seating in the town um, again with hand, um, armrests and age friendly parking spaces and so on. So um, there is some work done being done locally um, ad hoc, I guess. Um, around the country um, but again you know speaking with um, the program manager of the southwest region enterprise plan last week you know we spoke about this at national level is there a national strategy for the silver economy and the, the straight answer is no there isn't but the fact to know that we have it at you know the southwest um, stage you know there is certainly a scope and I suppose there is an onus on us uh, in higher education institutions as well to move this forward and, and to create um, awareness around it and to get it on the national agenda. Absolutely, Ashling. And, you know, simple things that you just talked about are, are definitely simple things that could be implemented in any yeah. small rural town or village in Ireland. And mm -hmm. they can become so inclusion uh, friendly for uh, anybody, really. And I think it's definitely something that we should um, definitely consider. Um, Ashling, I think, did you want to come in there, Ashling Marta, before we finish? Uh, no, thanks, Maura. Um, yeah, no, I just I wondered about I think the definition of the silver silver economy that you mentioned was the over 50s. Mm. Um, and I just wondered, um, is there different understanding understandings of it across Europe or is there kind of, you know, targeting of needs for, you know, 50s, 60s, different age groups, I suppose, are quite different in terms of their their needs. Um, and I was very interested yeah. to hear like the kind of uh, this discussion as it's evolving around the policy issues. And I wondered if you had a magic wand, what would be the first thing you do for the silver economy? Um, I know. Those, okay, we, yeah. Anyway, we're, we're nearly finished. Thank you. Yeah. Well, to come back to your first point around age, you know, when I go into a room and I say that the silver economy looks at over 50s, I get a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, worried looks, you know, over 50s is, you know, we're all not too far off that ourselves. So, um, yeah, there is different definitions around that age, the ages, age cohort, the WHO will be around the over 60s. And then an older adult is classified as over 65. Um, so there is a bit of deviation. The reason we focus on your 50s is because that's the definition used by the Euro European Commission. And we used it in the Interreg project as well. Um, a magic wand, I suppose, you know, my, my husband was self-employed at one stage. So I do understand that side, uh, that side of the world as well, you know, and 
it's just shouting it from the rooftops that this opportunity is there um, and that companies, that they will just be made aware of it, you know. Um, and it's a body of work that, and it is through the support of policymakers that hopefully we can get the message um, out there. And by doing seminars like this, you know, it's just really creating awareness. Like I started on this project about two, two and a half years ago. I didn't know anything about the silver economy then. And um, it's huge. I like, I'm very excited about it because it's a hugely interesting area uh, and of research and the project, the EU project that we've been involved in um, has been really, really, um, really good, you know, and really insightful. So that would be my key message, shouting it from the rooftops for sure. Great, Ashling. And on that note, um, I think we'll leave it for there, but I, I most definitely want to thank um, Ashling and Helen for a really interesting presentation today. I think it's one that, that kind of picked away at our brain and made us kind of sit up a little bit more and think about a, a much more broader, inclusive um, rural economy, uh, you know, as well as a rural society. So definitely Ashling and Helen, um, thanks most sincerely for that. As always, thanks to our, our partners in, in research and in everything else, uh, the Department of Rural and Community Development. Um, most definitely, I want to thank, um, our, I suppose, our own team in Galway, um, the Rural Studies Centre team, um, particularly Shane, who does a huge amount of work in the background for me on this, and most definitely Ashling Marta, who is, again, always there as well, ready with the questions. To you who have joined in today, um, thanks a million, and we will be on to you. I think we have UCD joining us in at the end of May. So um, Karen Keevney and Caroline Kramer and Brendan O'Keefe, I think, are joining us at the end of May. And we have James Morden at the end of June from GMIT looking at uh, issues around biodiversity. So we're looking forward to the end of May and to the end of June. So again, Ashling and Helen, Garmina Mahabath, and thank you very, very much. Thanks for now. Bye for everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah.